Welcome to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. Each week, we interview top experts in physical therapy, pain science, and integrative pain care. You'll learn the most up-to-date information for treating and reversing persistent pain. This podcast is for educational purposes only and not intended to be used as personalized medical advice. And now, here's your host, Dr. Joe Tata. Hey there, friends. Welcome to this week's episode of the Healing Pain Podcast. This week, we have an incredible guest, and we're discussing ways to heal and prevent common childhood diseases. Today's guest is an ear for parents, a voice for children, a resource for other healthcare professionals, and she's on a mission to help 1 million children get off meds they may not need if they were eating the right food for their healthy system. My guest today is Dr. Sheila Kilbane. She is a board-certified pediatrician who's also trained in integrative medicine. She practices medicine in Charlotte, North Carolina, and consults with physicians around the globe using her holistic strategies to help parents resolve eight chronic recurring health conditions. Dr. Kilbane, welcome to the Healing Pain Podcast. Thank you, Joe. It is so good to be here. I always, I always love to chat with you. So we're going to have fun today. Yes. Well, you let, let people know that we're, we're friends offline, right? Yeah. <laughs> as well as colleagues. So we can kind of blur the lines a little bit today. I'm excited because I know you've been working on an incredible book for many years because so many of the solutions that you offer children and adolescents are, are groundbreaking. They're not commonly available. And I know you've been putting all this information together, gathering the research, creating all your protocols. It's in a great book, which I want to you know, make sure everyone knows about right off the top of the bat. It's called Healthy Kids, Happy Moms, Seven Steps to Heal and Prevent Common Childhood Diseases. You can, of course, find that on Amazon. It's available it. now. You have it right here. here. I'm telling you, if you are a pediatric physical therapist, an OT, a pediatrician, if you're a mom, if, if you have children, if you ever were a child yourself, like this is really the book to get. So I'm excited to talk to Sheila today. So Thank Sheila, you. obviously, when at your, in the introduction, I mentioned that you're an integrative pediatrician. Tell us how you kind of made that transition from what we might identify as, you know, traditional allopathic pediatrics and moving more into the integrative medicine and health space. Yeah. So it's very similar to the way that, you know, you got into this and many of us is we, when I got out of residency and I started practicing, I was seeing the kids with, with all the illnesses, right? Chronic runny nose, reflux, eczema, recurrent ear, sinus infections, asthma, belly pain, constipation. And I would give them a medication. They would get better for two weeks and then they'd stop the meds. And then two weeks later, they'd be back in the office. So I was seeing these patients once a month and I'm somebody who's always going to ask why I'm not going to keep doing something if it's not working. And I just thought this is, you know, it was when I was prescribing an antacid to two and three month old babies that I was like, what is this? What are you doing? And so I started reading about nutrition and really doing listening to moms also. And I remember it like it was yesterday. It was a little patient I'd been seeing since he was born and he had eczema and recurrent ear infections and mom was breastfeeding him. And she said to me, you know, Dr. Kilbane, I took dairy out of my diet and his eczema started to improve. And so I'm like, and I'd laugh now because I had no idea at the time. And I said, well, let's keep it out and then we'll figure out what's going on. And then right before his one year well checkup, you know, his eczema had improved, but it hadn't gone away fully. She had a big plate of omelet, a, a big omelet. So just a bunch of eggs. There was no milk in it, but just a bunch of eggs. And he had a huge flare up. So mm -hmm. we're like, oh, so it's dairy and eggs. So we took eggs out of his diet, her diet also. And at that point in time, the eczema fully resolved. And then the fluid that was in his ears had resolved. And I had already referred them to get ear tubes, but due to an insurance glitch and all that kind of stuff, we, he didn't get the ear tube. So it was a big eye opener. And that's when I really started to research and read more. And it, you start making these food changes and it was like magic. And I thought this has to be a fluke or somebody would have told me about this during my training. And I, so I was pretty quiet for a long time and you just, you know, kind of stayed in my little corner and did my thing. You know, my partners would start saying to me, Sheila, what's that voodoo medicine you're right, practicing? Right. What's that weird stuff you're doing over there with food? But then a year later, they're like, what are the dose of those probiotics, Sheila? So it's, and it, 
so it just expanded from there. And when you see this happen once, you you want to scream it from a mountaintop because yeah. then when it was over and over and over, you just and I I couldn't I couldn't keep just prescribing an antibiotic for an ear infection or for whatever and not start to educate the parents about it. Yeah. So and I you know I, I don't I on this you know on the evolution of this podcast people know that I talk about allopathic medicine and that it's important. We need to have an allopathic system and we also need to have integrative, holistic, functional alternatives as well. And I'm always curious just to hear, you know, another professional's opinion as to why, for example, some of this didn't show up in your traditional pediatric, pediatric training and, and what we think of that today. Yes, absolutely. And I love this question because I believe 100%. That's why I love integrative medicine, because we combine the both. Right, the best of both. Right. That's right. And if we need a chest x-ray and an antibiotic, absolutely, we're going to use them. And it's when we, we're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for conventional medicine. And it, you know, I've been hit by a car. I've been thrown off a horse. As a young kid, I used to get kidney infections and I had to take an antibiotic for an extended period of time, you know, but a kidney infection is super serious if it's not treated. So it's, uh, it's the way we have this huge foundation. That's also why I love having the medical degree, because it's once you really understand something, then you can start to say, okay, let me make some modifications. We're going to do things safely and with the science behind it, but we're also going to look at nutrition, which we didn't get any training in. You know, I learned that low vitamin C can create scurvy, but that was the extent of it. And if people don't understand that, and it's, which, why would you, you would think that in medicine, we would study nutrition, but we spend a lot of time studying medications and the side effects, but we don't get training in nutrition. And it's, and that's why I also kind of counsel patients on not getting frustrated if you go to your physician and they're unable to give you information on supplements and nutrition. We, we just, it's a, it's an, I mean, I spent two years studying about this as a, you know, and, and longer, and then it's a continuing education. So, and it's, you know, which the supplement, you know, topic is a whole, we could talk for hours on that, but my recommendation with supplements is if you don't know what you're doing, don't do any, don't just start taking things because you can create harm. I treat supplements just like I treat medications. Sure. So, yeah. What, what kind of, I mean, obviously you're a pediatrician, so you're seeing children and adolescents, but what are the most common diagnoses that you're coming across that are chronic, that people don't need to be struggling with? Moms and their kids can start to reverse and start to treat naturally. Yeah. So it's, it's this list and they're inflammatory illnesses. And now, you know, in the world that we live in, people are starting to understand how inflammation impacts us. And so it's these, those, those illnesses that I had talked about. So it's reflux, recurrent ear and sinus infections, eczema, you know, those bumps on the back of the arms, asthma, wheezing, constipation and belly pain. And those are the ones that you know, integrative functional medicine, it's, you know, we really know how to deal with those well. And there are other, it, it extends into many other illnesses, including some autoimmune diseases and inflammatory bowel diseases. But for the purposes of my book and for the purposes of people listening, those are the main ones that we're talking about that you can make some really big strides in without necessarily having to do a consult with an integrative pediatrician. Have you seen the incidence of inflammatory bowel disease and autoimmune disease rise since you've been practicing? Mm -hmm. In my practice previously, we never, we were not seeing thyroid disease, inflammatory bowel disease. I mean, we have, you know, I have a very small, low volume practice. And so I know all the pain. I mean, right now I have three young boys with inflammatory bowel disease. That's, you know, that was unheard of previously. And we're also seeing kids now, we're seeing younger and younger kids, babies that have all of these gut issues. They're really fussy, 
you know, pain and parents are mom may be on a perfect diet. Like she's already eliminated a lot of the allergens from her diet and she's breastfeeding and you may be doing a probiotic, but the kids are still sick. So we're seeing these more complicated illnesses earlier on. And it's, but this is always the, the beauty of the way that we approach it in my practice. And I have a wonderful integrative pharmacist who is on my team and she and I together, because we have, you know, a little bit different training is we've developed a way of really focusing on digestion. And when we focus on digestion, that's where we start to see the magic happen. And that's how we get the long-term improvements because we're not just, when I first started practicing integrative medicine, kind of used supplements the way that I used medications is I would, if you had an iron deficiency, I would just give you a better form of iron than the prescription I used to give you. But now we really were pragmatic and we go through We really look at the triggers of inflammation and this is a long explanation for your question, but I I lay it out in the book as we have five main triggers of inflammation and we all have our genetics. So we, we always keep that in mind, but then we look at how do our genetics interact with food, environmental allergies, environmental toxins infectious diseases and stress, you know, and stress can be emotional. It can be physical. And, and that's where, you know, like physical therapists. And I have to say, when it comes to physical therapists, occupational therapists, they were the ones early on who really helped me to start shift the way that I was looking at things. And I mean, which is, it's a hugely interesting topic, you know, how you're breathing, how you're holding your body, because if you're, if we're not addressing everything, we, we won't see the magic. And that's what I just, I always talk about that. It's like this shift that you see and the kids' eyes get brighter, their dark circles under their eyes go away, their, that mouth breathing, right? That kind of that Darth Vader breathing starts to resolve. And it's just like this, ah, this is my, this is the child. This is their native system, how it should be working. So tell us those five triggers again, so we can kind of make a mental note of those and write them down. If you're at home, you have have a pen and paper, maybe you want to put on a post-it or take out your phone and just write those down. Absolutely. So it's food, it's environmental allergies, environmental toxins, which can be things like if you have mold, you know, from a water damaged building, things like that, exposures, um, infectious diseases. So we might have, you know, if you've got a chronic, you know, bacterial infection, if you're getting recurrent viruses, we've got to pay a lot of attention to that because our immune system is really designed to be effective at addressing Uh, you know, a lot of the things that we're exposed to day to day. And if your child is on antibiotics or you as an adult are on antibiotics once a month or even several times a year, that's too many. We We shouldn't need antibiotics regularly. And then the last one is stress. And stress, it can be emotional and it can be physical. And the way that I talk about it with with kids, and this applies, everything I talk about applies to adults, is we've got this we all impact each other significantly. And when we have a child, if you're in a household and say parents, maybe marriage is pretty tense, or maybe one parent travels a lot and the other parent is a stay at home parent basically through the week. And then they get home and there's all this tension. Well, the child is going to resonate with the predominant adult in the household. So one or both parents is really stressed we could have this child on perfect nutrition and perfect supplements, but their system is going to be in fight or flight right with the parents. And in fight or flight, we get a shift in the way our blood flows and our blood is shunted away from our frontal cortex, which is where we do our math. We do our homework, make our decisions shunted away from the frontal cortex more to our primitive brain. And then our heart rate goes up, our respiratory rate goes up, and our blood also shunts away from the GI tract where we digest our food and it goes to our arms and our legs so that we can run away from that proverbial lion that's in the forest. 
and it's it's going to impact behavior, digestion, all you know, our ability to absorb our nutrients. And then our adrenal glands are going to be kicking out our stress hormones. And when that's happening, we're burning through our magnesium, our, our B vitamins, uh, some of our other minerals. And we're, we're, it's like uh, there, there's a hole in the bucket. We can dump a whole lot of supplements in, but if we don't plug up our bucket, bucket we're not going to get that long-lasting improvement. Mm. So that's a you know, that's, that's why we can't leave out any piece of the puzzle. So kind of, I mean, just, we'll start with the last one there, obviously stress. Uh, this tribe understands the impact of adverse childhood experiences on yes. a growing brain and body. I mean, just the rates of chronic disease, obesity, chronic pain, chronic IBS are very high in those populations. So they're, you know, vitally important topics for all of us to, to consider both in individuals and, and communities as well, because a lot of this is um, community related. And then, you know, when you talk about diseases that are out there, obviously this has been a year of, you know, a significant pathogen that has affected those with chronic diseases first. And when we think about this pathogen that's been out there, the coronavirus, you know, what comes to mind first is elderly people, or maybe those who are diabetic and obese, but let's not forget some of those with chronic diseases who have diabetes, pre-diabetes, asthma, are young kids, right? Absolutely. And I love that you brought this up because it's that, and that the timing of the book, you know, you can never, you could never predict any of these things. And we don't, you know, nobody wants to this pandemic at all, let alone to be lasting as long as it is. But I started writing this book actually when I met Joe in 2016. And then it's just, it's been a process. Like you've been right, you've written several books and getting it to a place. And it's so much better now because we have all these visuals to really explain inflammation. Because I think it's a hard concept. People are like, what, what does that mean? Because we think of a sprained ankle or a a jammed finger. And we know if you sprain an ankle, you get all this, these white blood cells go to that area. And that's those white blood cells are what we consider inflammation. They're cells that they go to an area and they will help clean up that dead tissue or that injured tissue from the sprained ankle. But then, you know, three to six months goes by and then your joint feels like yourself again. So I talk about decrease, uh, decreasing our systemic inflammation the same way I talk about healing a sprained ankle. And in kids, in my experience, it generally takes about three to six months, depending upon what's going on in them. You know, kids who are healthy, it's a lot quicker. But for like, if you have a child with pretty significant asthma, it's going to take us a little minute to really get their inflammation down. But then once that happens, if you get exposed to a virus, you're not going to have that big whoosh of inflammation because it's the inflammation in response to the virus that's causing so many of the problems. So if we can keep that to a minimum, then when we get, we're always going to get exposed to things. So then when we get exposed to them, we're not going to have as big an issue with it. And I'll, I'll give you a, a concrete example. So one of the cases that I write about in the book was a, a little boy who was four or five when they came to see me and had recurrent wheezing. And he was one of those mouth breathers and had needed inhalers and once had to go on an oral steroid for the wheezing. And he went berserk with the steroids. You know, some people just don't tolerate steroids well. So the mom was like, I need to figure this out. I cannot put him on an oral steroid again. And so we just go through his history and a lot of, lot of runny nose. He also had the big dark circles under his eyes. He was really fussy as a baby, kind of that colicky reflexy, and which is a classic history of a dairy sensitivity. So we took dairy out of his diet and then he had a, dust, a really significant dust mite allergy. His mattress was at least 20 years old. It had been his uncle's from when his uncle was in college. So that mattress is going to be full of dust mites. So we threw out the mattress. We got rid of dairy. And within three weeks, he came back and he was like a different child. And the mom is just going, 
why, why didn't I, how come I didn't know about this? And I just said, you know, this is the way that I practice now, but I didn't know that before. So this isn't, it's, it's not the fault of, well, I will say that more information is out there now, but it's, we really have to have to understand our medical training to know, you know, where we want to get this information, which is why Joe does what he does. It's why I do what I do, because we want our colleagues and the families that we work with to understand how this stuff, we can really make a big difference. And for a couple of my patients who are, have really significant asthma, it has been like the, you know, a couple of them came a year before the pandemic started. And it is like the parents and, and my team are like, thank God we've got this under control before this happened because they feel a lot more comfortable now and they, you know, they're doing all the precautions, but they have a better, their children have been able to catch a virus and not end up in the hospital automatically. So from these five triggers, food is at the top of your list there. Yes. Food can be challenging for families, right? Mm -hmm. Someone has to go out and do the shopping. Someone has to prepare the food. Someone has to make sure that the children are sitting down and eating the food, making them snacks or lunch or school lunches, et cetera, et cetera. Where do you start with educating and counseling parents on kind of like the, just the lowest level? Cause sometimes it can be overwhelming for a parent. Like you mean milk, the milk I drank my whole life, like is not right yeah. for my child at this point in their life, so to speak. So where do you start with the mom who's a little overwhelmed, but you, you're a hundred percent on board with this is the direction we need to take. Yes. So we start, we do baby steps and we, we change one thing at a time, which I I do no matter what, even in the practice, because we want to, if we see improvements or worsening, we want to know what made, you know, what made the difference. So I start what I call the mini cleanse for kids, which I love that name. Everybody was like, you can't say that, but I, I said it and I love it because all we're, we don't want to go to dairy right away is we want to go. Are you, let's look at, at sugar drinks. You know, are you doing soda? Are you doing a lot of juice? You know, juices we think of as healthy, but a cup of orange juice has almost as much sugar as a cup of soda. So we just start there and we know that the amount of sugar that's in about two you know, those sodas like this suppresses your immune system for five hours. So we're just going to say, cut out the sugar drinks. And it's like taking a boot off of your immune system. I mean, it's even, it's even amazing to me that there are certain organizations that have recommendations on how much added sugar can be in a baby or a child or an adolescent's diet, so to speak. And I'm, I'm kind of like, look, we all have, you know, something sweet winds up on all of our plates at some point but I don't think we should be encouraging um, a normative value of added processed sugar in a child's diet. Yeah. And I did, I included those values in the book that from the American Heart Association, Mm -hmm. just because I want people to start getting, you know, really understanding this. And you look at, I play this game with my nephews all the time because they know how to do it. As you take the you know number look at the sugar that's on the back of it and you divide it by 4 and that's the number of teaspoons there are 4 grams of sugar in a teaspoon and you can get an organic coconut vanilla flavored yogurt and it has 25 grams of sugar right that's 6 teaspoons no parent would ever dream that a, a food company would put six teaspoons into something that we're marketing to kids. And it's small. It doesn't even look like it could fit six teaspoons. No. Right. Right. And so it's like, if you want to do that, if they love that flavor, you take a, maybe a teaspoon out or a tablespoon and maybe you mix it with something or you put it in your smoothie, but that's not, you know, our, our taste buds are used to their, our kids' taste buds are bathed in sugar. And what I find, and that's why I don't put a huge emphasis. We just do this. We just kind of do it. And the kids naturally, their palates start to change, especially if you have a picky eater at home is we don't sit and try to, you know, you sit at the table and you eat everything on your plate. We just gradually make. So the first thing is, you know, we look at sugar drinks and then we move to artificial dyes and colors, Mm -hmm. which is another, you know, there's a tremendous amount of research 
since 2010 in England, they have made companies put a label on foods that this can change a child's behavior, right? right? That was it means it's changing their brain and nervous system. Yes. A hundred percent. And it harms the gut. You know, we're always, we always talk about gut health in integrative and functional medicine. So it, those, like, if you could start with those two things, that would make me the happiest person ever. And then we work on adding, I, if you can do a green smoothie in the morning, because you can, and you start with a whole bunch of fruit, make it really sweet with a lot of fruit and put, you know, two leaves of spinach or two leaves of lettuce. And then as they start to like it, then you start to decrease the fruit content and increase the, the greens. And you can end up getting three to four servings of fruits and vegetables in the kids just with one green smoothie in the morning mm. and you can send them out the door feeling awesome or you can make popsicles with them right pour it into a little thing and that's a great little snack that they can have when they come home from school that's a great tip even for adults because so many adults have that sweet tooth trained in them and you give them you know a, a smoothie with almond milk and a scoop of protein powder and some kale and they're like hey dr joe this does not taste good at all and instead, okay, now add some strawberries and blueberries and blackberries and maybe like a little bit of a peach. And then it makes it a little bit sweeter. And then you can kind of basically taper them down is what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's we, brilliant. Call it, we call it, our health coach calls it a starter smoothie. I love that. I like, love that. Okay. And that's the other thing too, is a little, like I'll put, I do a smoothie every morning and I just do like this much of a banana because it gives, bananas we know have a lot of sugar in them. But, it, and I'm somebody that it works for my system, right? I also don't think there's one diet that fits everyone. So we all have to figure out what works for us. And just a little bit, it gives creaminess. So either a banana or avocado, and it gives you, it gives you that creaminess. So you can use water as a base and you don't necessarily have to do one of the definitely, you know, we don't want to use dairy or orange juice or anything like that as the base, um, but anyway, so that's the first thing. And then as we move on to the, for the mini cleanse is we start to decrease the packaged snacks and use a fruit, a vegetable, you know, maybe a hard boiled egg. If your child to tolerates eggs, like I'd rather you have a baked chicken in the refrigerator and they eat a little bit of, you know, pull some of the chicken off the refrigerator. And that's part of what their snack is. And then we move on to the processed fats. And these are, if we're doing, if we're eating out, we're getting a lot of processed fats that are the, have a lot of inflammation. And that's also, I'm a big advocate for planning your meals out for the week, the same way you would plan a trip or the same way you plan your sporting events and know when you have crunch time. So when do I need to have a snack in the car so that we don't have to stop at McDonald's or wherever we're going to go. And I, li I live in the South and Chick-fil-A is sort of like people consider it their health food, mm -hmm. um, fast food. So, which is right. A bit of an oxymoron. Um, so we want to plan our food the way that we're planning our, our, a, a trip. And, and also considering your health like that, just, we want you to plan things out and having cooler bags, just having all of your system ready to go, you know, have your refillable water bottles with your filtered water and just starting there, you know, don't delve into dairy and gluten and all that stuff. Just start there and then you can go. And I walk, I walk you through all of this in the book and I have swap outs. We made it really clear, really visual and getting everybody in the family involved and dad doesn't get a pass. Dad's got to be part of this as well. And, you know, people want to do what they can outside of the house, but we've, I'm doing it together because I think if you have the food at home, adults can't resist it, right? If you have all the yummy, I, I will go grab whatever cookie or thing is in my house. So you just, you can't have it if you don't want to eat it. And then, and then we go on to processed meats, you know, and we want, if we're doing meats, ideally get, you know, grass fed or, you know, wild game if you can, but you want to steer clear of the deli meats and hot dogs and things like that. And if you're going to do them, definitely get organic, get nitrate free, you know, and there are companies popping up, right. That have cleaner meats and it, that th those things alone are going to make a huge difference. As I was flipping through your book, I came across a, a section on supplements 
And I had to really, you know, pause for a minute and think back to, you know, my ch childhood. I'm like, what did I really have for supplements? And really what comes to mind is chewable Flintstones. <laughs> that, would, that was the version of like, you know, the seventies and eighties. That's pretty much what was on the shelves that people had access to. And physicians at that point, unless you were, you know, an alternative medicine physician at that time, we're not talking about supplements. We're not recommending supplements. Where do you begin that process with, with kids and parents? Yeah. So the, the first thing are the, the statistics with how many fruits and vegetables, we also ate very differently as kids, mm -hmm. right? We were eating, at least in my household, and I have a feeling your parents were the same way, is that we didn't have sugar foods. We didn't have sodas, you know, we had this big garden in the out in the back. And I remember, you know, my mother would buy a box of sugar cereal every once in a while. I'm the youngest of five. It would be gone within hours. And because we just didn't get that. And so kids these days, it's the statistics are, I think it's 65% do not get the adequate number of fruits in a day and 93% don't get adequate vegetables. So that's the first thing is we're, most kids and definitely the kids I see in my practice were starting from a place of depletion. And so it's really hard to make up that difference if, you know, unless you're going to stay home and make everything from scratch and do all that stuff, because most of the, most of us also have compromised digestion. We have stress. We're eating a lot of things that aren't good for us. We're taking a medication, right? 65% of 60, well, 65% of the world's medications are from the U S and we are only 5% of the world's population. So, you know, chances are, if you're listening, somebody in your household is on a prescription medication, if not more than one. So that's the one thing is we're really not eating what we should be eating, you know, and then there is some research showing that you know, fruits and vegetables today don't have as high a nutrient content as they did 30, 40 years ago, you know, and it's, you know, the crop rotation and all that sort of thing. And or, organic, I always make this point because people think even if it's organic, if it's, if people aren't treating the soil properly, an organic tomato can be nutrient depleted the same way a regular tomato can be. So it, that's where we really need, and I would love to be able to do this without supplements because it's, sometimes it's a pain to get supplements into kids. And we, you know, I have to use a significant amount of supplements in my practice to get the kids back in the balance. But, you know, if the kids are generally healthy, I, I lay it out in the book, what to do and how to do it. And if they have anything going on, we do, you know, I, we, we do a probiotic first for, for a week. And then you would do a digestive enzyme. And then we would add in an omega-3 fat, which you know can be a fish oil. You can do it also a vegetarian um, way as well. But I don't, I'm not gonna add a lot of fats into a child's diet unless I know they're actually digesting and absorbing that because otherwise we're gonna get expensive urine and expensive stool. And you know, and then we do a whole food supplement and then vitamin D in the winter time only. I much prefer that kids get, we always want to get things naturally if we can, you know, and you need, you know, roughly 15 to 30 minutes a day, but without sunscreen, but without burning, you know, and I, I live in North Carolina, so that can be a little bit tricky. So you just have to, you know, you have to think about that. Um, but then we do it, like if we need to do some gut healing, we do that over three to six months. And then uh, my recommendations are a whole food supplement year round. And then just in the winter time, we're going to add in the vitamin D, the, you know, a probiotic, just because the research is so good with how that supports the immune system. And, and all of that, we ha I have it in graphs. I have it very clearly laid out in the book. Um, and then if you go on to our, to my, to my website, it's that, that Sheila Kilbane.com forward slash book. We've got some downloads for you right now, just some, some things that you can get. And I have the full, you know, just as a download, the, the supplement guide. Yeah. And just so everyone knows um, her book, healthy kids, happy moms, which is written for moms as well as children. What's great about this book is it's colorful. There's lots of pictures and images and figures, which make it really easy to pick up and read. And obviously to, 
to use in your life. So I, I appreciate that because obviously kids could be looking at it and maybe school teachers, moms, nursery school teachers. It's really a great visual that you have in there for, for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So we've been kind of dialing into like more like the individual, you know, the person with the condition, the gut inflammation, things like that. I also know you're a person who has bigger visions and bigger missions. And it's funny because I was doing some research for a, a lecture that I gave on nutrition and pain. And there's a really great study from Canada that they identified those with food insecurity mm. are more likely to have chronic pain and they're more likely to use opioids. And this was a huge study done in Canada, 65,000 people. And they found that food insecurity was a, a risk factor that was more important than education and more important than economic status. So it shows you how important food and nutrition really is for that population. But I know it's important for kids too. And they had this, in the US, they have this, um, they have a picture of the United States and they show the food insecure states, which are pretty much the ones in the Southern part of the country. And those states align with obesity. And it's a little strange because you think, well, if they're food insecure, if they don't have access or the economic means to access food, yeah. how can they be obese? But we know they're eating very high caloric processed sugar foods. But what do you start to think about, you know, kind of the bigger picture of children, you know, in our own communities, in our own country, um, kids who might not have access to food at school, or maybe doesn't, they don't have access to an integrative, you know, medicine pediatrician like yourself, how do we start to help them, um, you know, access in a way that's affordable and easy for them? And this is where I have my huge interest lies because it's really a luxury what we're talking about, right? Pulling things out of the diet. If you don't have food, you don't care what it is. You're going to eat it. Well, any of us would be like that. And we, from, as, from a government perspective, the foods that we are offering families of lower income and the kids at school is really poor quality, nutrient poor, calorie dense foods. And it is, you know, things like a lot of these sugar cereals. And, you know, I've heard schools that offer cinnamon, you know, like a cinnamon, um, what do I want to say? Biscuit roll. Yeah. Roll. Roll. Yes. Is, is that's what, with an orange juice and that's what they're going to get for breakfast and Flour, then, sugar and more sugar and more sugar. And then if, and then we're going to stick them in a classroom and then the teacher is going to be the one to have to control that behavior. If, if, if you or I ate one of those, we would be bouncing off the walls. I mean, we'd feel sick first of all, because we don't eat like that. And it's, we're just, we're, we're not, thinking we've completely lost the forest through the trees and schools will say they can't do this because they can't cut, they can't do fresh fruits and vegetables because they don't have the equipment to cut it up. So everything has to come in as a package. And this is where we really need to be looking at policies. But when you, and I write, I have a, I have a chapter on dairy because dairy is kind of, to me, dairy is the elephant in the room in the medical world. Mm -hmm. Because it's, you know, according to my American Academy of Pediatrics, I should be recommending that all kids drink through two or three cups of milk a day because that's how they're going to get their calcium and it's a, a good source of nutrition. The reality with dairy is that a cup of milk has about half as much sugar as a cup of soda. So the lactose and sugar in dairy, we don't think about that too much, but that's a sugar. And it's there. And, and I, I have a nice table in the book where I, I point out the research showing Okay, this is what the studies show about dairy and recurrent ear infections. Dairy about, and with with eczema and with, you know the the studies on asthma are much smaller, but when you look at it from this overall perspective of inflammation, so that is it's a huge challenge, and it's it's a lot of you know the inner city kids and these are the you know, these are the populations that are much more vulnerable and they do, don't have access to this other food. So this is where we need to be talking to our government officials, our pol policy making, and we need fruits and vegetables. Like if we could do anything, if you could add 
you know, one more fruit and one more vegetable into the diet per day, that would be a huge start. And it's, I, I wish I had all the answers, but this is part of what with, with writing this book is I would want this to get in the hands of people who can make more of those changes because it isn't rocket. Nutrition is not rocket science. We've made it very complicated, but that's why I did that mini cleanse because it, it isn't as complicated as we made it. We just need to go back. We need to go backward with our nutrition. And, you know, it used to be that you would have, well, let me, so now a child might have a bowl of cereal and milk for breakfast, piece of pizza for lunch and chicken nuggets and French fries for dinner. There has been, you know, those French fries are considered a vegetable and they've otherwise had zero nutrient dense food. And one of the chapters I have, it's overfed and undernourished. And that's what's happening as we're, we get, you know, and I do blood work on all the kids and we see iron deficiencies, we see zinc deficiencies. And if you're, if you're inflamed and you're not eating the right foods, your body just isn't absorbing nutrients effectively and efficiently out of the food that you are eating. So this, this, you know, my intention is that that book, this book is just going to be a jumping off point for us to really continue that conversation of how are we going to get healthy food to all, to all kids and all adults. Yeah. And it's a very brave conversation to have to enter into and start to talk about, Hey, here's how we make nutrition simple. Because as we know, you know, our fellow trained PhD, whatever professionals have made nutrition into a science, which it is, but the Mm -hmm. habits don't have to be, as you mentioned, the habits and principles don't have to be that complicated. And then how do we, how do we then take a hard look at our communities, countries, churches, and say, There are certain members of our community that don't have food and they need to have access to high quality, nutrient dense food to feed their growing brains and body. Because if they don't, we're going to inherit, and we are inheriting more and more chronic disease in our, in our country and globally. And there, I have a a quote in my book and I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's, it's research from Harvard and if we continue at the rate that we are, <clears throat> I think it's 50% of kids will be obese by the time they're in their mid thirties, if we continue on the way that we are going. And David Katz, who is, he started the integrate or the, the preventive medicine program at Yale. He wrote the forward to my book and he really kind of honed into also what is the responsibility of the food companies? Mm-hmm. And we are, we're letting all of these companies off the hook, right? They're, they're, you know, Coca-Cola, how many billions of dollars, or I should, you know, maybe I shouldn't be naming names, but it's, it's all the companies it's, and we are buying it and we know marketing works. That's why these companies spend millions of dollars on marketing. And it's, you know, the, the, those of us who do integrative and functional medicine, we don't have marketing degrees and it's getting this information that how do you make it sexy to eat fruits and vegetables? And that's where we've got to have these stars. And I, I love talking about Tom Brady and Mich- Michelle, uh, his wunsch and his wife, because this guy's 45. There is a reason that he can still be in the NFL and there's a, they, they take food very seriously. And I, 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 I always, I especially always talk about him. If dads are starting to give us grief about not wanting to make these food changes. And if we can start to right, they can make it sexy. There are these beautiful celebrities and that's who we seem to look toward in this, in this, culture that we live in. So let's start to look to the people who make feeling good fun. And Joe and I were talking about before we started this is that what I do in my practice helps to prevent the adults from coming to you later on with chronic pain, with all of these body aches. And when we establish that early on, it's very true. I mean, we have opportunities, whether you're a parent or a sibling or an aunt or an uncle or 
the neighbor down the block, you have an opportunity to model behavior for every kid you run into on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. And, and if, if those behaviors are modeled, um, kids do pick up on it. There was a, a great video that was trending a couple of weeks ago. It's the, he's a, um, a Portuguese soccer player. I can't remember his name right now. Ronaldo is his first name. And he, um, they placed during, a, during an interview, they placed a Coke bottle in front of him. And he took the Coke bottle, he slid it way down to the end of the table and then put a water bottle in front of him. And I thought, you know, how great of an opportunity that he's setting an example, not only for adults watching him, but so many kids watch, you know, soccer players around the world. And they saw this, you know, really healthy superstar push a sugary soft drink out of the way. And he didn't say anything, but it just sends the message so beautifully that this is not a health promoting food. This is not how I became a healthy adult. hundred percent. And it is kids do what we do, not what we say. So it's, we just, we have to live it and, you know, we have to walk the walk and it, it is because it can be a bit of a pain. And I mean, we all take, my family makes a lot of fun of me, but they do, you know, they listen to me and m- most time and in, in sort of, <laughs> but they feel better. You know, it's, it's, my sister gets these rashes on her face and she's like, all right, I'm staying off of it now. And, you know, she'll fall off the wagon. And um, so it just, it makes, I just, life is better. Right. And if you're, if you're any kind of a spiritual being, or you have a, you know, a connection to nature, to outside, when you physically feel better, you can, you have that connection better. And that's when I think we can be kinder to one another because if you're not feeling good, that's when you're snapping at your kids or your spouse. And it's right. What is life if we're, you know, if you feel crummy all the time? I've been speaking with Dr. Shil Kilbane. She is an integrative pediatrician. She has a brand new book out. I recommend you pick it up today, right? As soon as you're done listening to this, it's called Healthy Kids, Happy Moms, Seven Steps to Heal and Prevent Common Childhood Diseases. You can, of course, find it on Amazon. You can also check her out at her website. Really easy to remember. Her website is SheilaKilbane.com. Yeah. That's SheilaKilbane.com. I want to thank my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Sheila Kilbane, for coming on this week and talk to, talking to us about how to reverse chronic disease in our children, which is an important topic, and how to promote health in them, which is an even more important topic. Make sure you share this podcast out with your friends and family and colleagues on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, a Facebook group, a LinkedIn group, whatever group you're into, grab the link and share it in there and make sure to check out her book. I'm Dr. Joe Tatum. We'll see you next week. Absolutely. Thank you, Joe. This has been great. Thank you for listening to the Healing Pain Podcast with Dr. Joe Tata. To subscribe to the podcast and learn more, visit integrativepainscienceinstitute.com. That's integrativepainscienceinstitute.com. Sign up to receive weekly updates, leave a review on iTunes, and share this episode with your friends.